Hey, what's going on? It's Kevin Deers here from Everflowing Stream. Thank you so much for checking out my channel. This is where I get to interview really cool artists, musicians, and I'm going to try and expand the channel and interview a wide variety of people here in 2022. So happy new year. This is my first video of 2022. Uh, before I jump into it, please rate, subscribe, comment, all of that good stuff. It really helps me out. And I'm trying to build up this channel. Recently, I just got to 100 subscribers. And uh, that was that was a, a, a really cool thing for me. That was a goal for mine. I know I'm not like, a, you know, a huge channel here, but I'm trying to build it and trying to get some good content in there. So I really appreciate everyone who's who's down to check it out. Uh, right now, I'm going to jump into an interview with Oysten Brun from Bork Nagar. Very, very awesome band. Incredible band. And they're going to be playing... Uh, the Northwest, and they're going to be playing on a big tour with Rotting Christ. Uh, the reason I said the Northwest is because I'm based here in Seattle, and uh, they haven't played here in, in years and years and years. Uh, so it's going to be really cool to see them at El Corazon. But they're going to be all over the United States in April, uh, hoping that uh, things calm down a little bit with, with you know what's going on and everything, and hope that uh, you know this wave kind of subsides a little bit and... Uh, we get some Bork Nagar back in the States. So without any further ado, here's my interview with Oyston Brun from Bork Nagar. The Rock, and right now I'm talking with Oyston Brun. Did, did I say your name correctly? Yeah, pretty much. I'm kind of used to a little bit weird pronunciations, but but that's all, all, all good. <laughs> Can I hear you say it? Oystein. 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 Yeah, Oysten. it's kind of a, a tone in there that uh, that doesn't. It's kind of a very typical Norwegian kind of thing. So, I, I I'm not not really sure if if you know you from states and stuff is really able to to do that note, so to speak. But it's pretty close though. Okay, okay. Well, um, he's the guitarist, the founding member of the Norwegian black metal band Bork Nagar, and I've been saying that so long for years. We've been doing the radio show for ten years. Have I been saying that correctly? Bork in the gutter. That's that's with it. That's all good. That's all good. Yeah, okay. I, I don't I don't really know how to pronounce it myself. Whether I talk Norwegian or English, you know, it's it's kind of a weird name to, especially yeah, you know, it's it's what it is. So so it's all good. Okay, cool, man. Well, uh, we're getting in back into show mode, man. We are. There's actually a ton of shows going on this weekend here in Seattle, and it's a beautiful thing to see music return to the city, return to the world. Uh, and the devastation of the nation tour was going to go down right around the time that everything closed down. And uh, the 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 show is happening Sunday, April 24th at El Corazon. Uh, and it's going to be uh, a really, really awesome tour with Rotting Christ, Wolfheart, Abigail Williams, and Bork in the Gar. And uh, I'm here to talk with Oyston about this. Uh, so curious, um, how good must it feel to have this final this show finally this tour, this full tour of the United States, you know, actually going ahead now, because I know it had to get rescheduled a couple times and jostled here and there, but it must feel really good, man. Oh, yeah, it feels really good. And, and you know, we have been been longing to get back to the States for so, so long time. We did we did one off show at Malin Death Fest a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. I think. Um, it was amazing. Um, and we also did, you know, back in the day in 1999, we had a... Had a kind of old school tour with Emperor back in the day, Picatum and Divine Emperor, I think it was. And, and you know, ever since that tour, I mean, it was a rough tour back then in 99. Everything was on the ground-ish. We dri was driving around in a car in the heat wave without any air conditioning and stuff. And it was brutal. But we also kind of, we have so many good memories from that tour, uh, traveling around in the U.S. And we had a lot of days off, or not a lot, but we had some days off and stuff. And we had a really good time in the end of the day. Uh, at least that is what we remember. So, so you know, ever since that, we have been kind of longing back to the U.S. Um, yeah. just to get our meet fans, play shows, uh, at least from our experience, which is not that a lot or that much really, though, so to speak. But but we always had a very good time in the U.S. for playing for, for, for the audience in the U.S. Always good shows, always good audience and stuff like that. So, you know, we have been longing for a, this tour for a long time, so to speak. So so it's, it's good to feel that, uh, you know, it's good to... Everything is a little bit... 
I don't know it. You know, we have already postponed the tour two times. This is the mm -hmm. thir third time. Everything seems to work out all right this yeah. this time around. I really, really hope so. And uh, we are ready to go and all that. But, but you know, um, I'm not sure if I believe it before I'm actually on a flight, <laughs> to be honest <laughs> with you. But, but you know, that being said, uh, it seems really, you know, solid now and, and, and everything seems to go according to the book. So, so let's um, hope for the best. It'd be an awesome run. And, and it's, as I said, it's, it's, it's uh, something we really, really want to do. I mean, we've already lost a lot of money on this project, mm -hmm. so to speak, to do it to Corona. We were supposed, you know, the, the outbreak of Corona when everything closed down and stuff like that. I think that was at least Norwegian time. It was a Thursday or something like that and we were supposed to travel the tuesday after oh so so we got it it's you know we got it really in the face i was ready i was packed up with my guitars and stuff and i was just planning to to stay home with my family the week and have a good time with my family and then mm -hmm. travel off to the us and do the tour and then i kind of woke up one morning and i got a <laughs> message from our manager that no trump closed everything <laughs> yeah let's forget about it you know that was that was tough uh, you know it's it's you know touring is also a, a mental side of things you know you have to prepare for it you have to oh, yeah. uh, be ready for it physically mentally uh, i was training before the tour i have to train again before doing this tour you know um, and 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 also you know the the, the um, all the things that we look forward to uh, just slipped out of our hands so to speak over yeah. in you know in a matter of minutes basically so so uh, so it it feels good to be to be back on track and and uh, looking at the the US tour in the horizon so to speak so when things shut down and you're and you're you're staying home and i'm i'm assuming so uh, i'll i'll just uh, get this out there are you in norway right now yeah 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 okay cool so that's where you're based out of so when you know you, you realize oh crap okay guess we're not going on tour what did you how did you guys handle it did you guys go into like songwriting mode did you personally like work a day job did you just stay home with your your family what what how did you stay sane during the pandemic assuming that you did stay sane uh, yeah that's <laughs> always a question isn't it <laughs> i don't know if i'm saying but you know uh, everything is relative i guess um well you know the first days the couple of days the first weekend we were like you know it was just um we just had to digest the whole situation, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had to, you know, what the fuck? What are we going to do? Um, uh, but but actually, quite fast. I, th I think it was actually the the morning after or something. I just uh, just because I also have a studio. I I have been build spending the last spending the last you know almost ten years like building and establishing my own studio with high high end stu uh, studio equipment yeah. and all that stuff and. And and I kind of the the morning, pretty much after we we, we realized that we, we are not going on tour, I just sent a message to to Lars because he had you know showed showed me some projects and some demo tapes and stuff like that of a project he had going, and I was like just sending him a text message and then should we mix? Let's do some mixing then. Um, yeah. So I, I mean we was I'm kind of happy with how we kind of made the situation to something positive anyways in in a sense um, on on the business side of things in terms of the ban i mean the, the devastation of the the nation guys was quick to turn around we was like in a couple of days we rescheduled the tour a, a year after just just you know change it from 2020 to 2021 little did we know that this pandemic would would last this long though but but you know we we tried to pick up on things as soon as possible and 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 kind of turn twist the whole thing to something positive in all this this grief so to speak and 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 personally speaking i you know i, I my my studio have been literally blowing up i mean in terms of projects i've been doing a lot of projects and um albums and productions masterings and whatnot so so it has been a creative year in in studio also of course we have been starting to 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 jam out some some ideas for a new album and stuff like that we haven't we haven't framed it yet or planned it too much yet because we we really really want to you know tour true north before we do release another album um 
not because not because you know we just want to bring this album out in a proper way because we are so satisfied with this album that we want you know people we want to bring it out there so to speak um and and so we don't stress on the next album but of course we have a lot of material ready probably everything so f- rough mixes at least or rough scratches of the songs yeah. um so it has been um and still is quite creative and i think that is this this if i can say beauty of the situation is that um it you know it didn't turn out too bad even though you know of course band side of things horrible i mean we also had to 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 postpone and and cancel european tours and a bunch of festivals and lost a lot of money and all that the whole story shebang but we, we may we have survived all good we shouldn't complain there is bands that is probably much worse than us so to speak um and talking about myself i've been working non-stop in my studio 24 awesome. 7 since the outbreak yeah. of pandemic producing i don't know how many albums and masterings Wonderful. and singles and whatever so it's quite a lot that's awesome. So I'm I'm curious. I I you know I probably sound kind of ignorant asking this question, but uh, I'm not as familiar with your your work as a producer and and, and as an engineer and, and your work at your. Uh, do you specialize in rock and, and heavy metal, or do you do it all across the board? Um, you know, I I always try to keep in, in terms of music. I've always tried to keep an open mind on things. I don't, you know, I, I never, you know, the same thing with my music and the music I do myself. I don't want to limit myself, at least not mentally speaking. Of course, it, sure. of course, I do metal, like, you know, I can't get away from that. But but, yeah. but I always try to keep, as a, as a mental concept or idea, I always try to keep open doors and open, you know, in theory, I want to do whatever, you know, I, c- I could in theory do a jazz album or next album or a hip hop album. Nobody could could arrest me or shoot me for it because, you know, yeah. I've always, that is the mentality of the band. I, of course, I don't going to do that, but but to keep this mentality is important. And I th- same thing I pretty much had the, towards the, the, the studio thing as well. Um, but of course, it, you know, there is something... I'm in, in deep, deep shit when it comes to metal in in, in a way. So I don't. Well, get people away know from you it. from that. They know you're, yeah. you're you're yeah. You have quite the the pedigree when it comes to that. So yeah, I, yeah. I can't get that. away from that. So of course that's that's a kind of a natural evolution, I would say. I guess uh, doing a lot of metal, but I also done some masterings from local, you know, pop rock bands and stuff like that. Cool. Just you know things like that. I have done. One friend of mine is doing a completely different style of music, which isn't even, you know, I don't know how to call it, what to call that kind of music. But it's really cool to try, uh, you know, challenge myself on, on completely yeah. different soundscapes and stuff like that. So I've done some of that. But the big scope of things, it's a lot of metal, of course. Uh, I've, I, yeah, I've done, I've done, this, done this White Void project, for example, with Lars. Um, is out on nuclear blast now uh, these days um and and there will be our next album after this one probably next year or something and some local bands some bigger bands um, and also i can't say much about it now but i have a quite celebrity in studio right now so to speak oh. in, in the metal in the black metal scene but but i can't say too much about it right now but uh, but well, tell him i said hi <laughs> <laughs> he's not in, in present in studio, but his music. Fair enough. To, okay. to be. But but quite you know some it's kind of growing growing a little bit. So um, you know I can't I cannot argue that I have any name when it comes to producing in general. I'm basically nobody. But but uh, things is starting to work pretty well on 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 this this uh, project as well. So yeah, let's see. Yeah, making a living doing what you love. That's what it's all about, man. That's what it's all yeah, about. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying, you know, to to keep keep uh, you know, for me it's 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 um that's also part of the whole whole you know thing that it's it's kind of, you know, back in the day when I when we started with the early albums, the first album for example, the second albums, you know, that was old school. We had the studio for three weeks record all the stuff in two weeks and then we mix and master the album the last week or three days or whatever. Um, but, you know, back in the day, I always had this and, and had for a long, long time this 
you know, if you're a painter, if you are an artist, a writer of books or something like that, what mm. you get when you buy a painting, it's basically what the painter was supposed to do, wanted to, yeah. to reveal to this world. But as a musician, I always felt that there is some kind of limitation between me and the audience because you have to go through an expensive studio, you have mm -hmm. to find the right producer, you have to, you know, you you are not guaranteed that the, this picture, this musical picture I'm doing yeah. is the same picture that people actually buy out there, if, if you get my point. And that's a, a something that always have bugged me in a sense. So since quite many years, I, I was early out with Cubase in late 90s, of course, just mm -hmm. for demoing and stuff like that. But I've always had this idea in my back of my head when I get the chance, when I get the you know funds to do stuff like this, to 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 try to what can I say f fusion the whole music musician aspect and also the producer aspect. I, I in a sense I always had this idea about I want to to go all the way with my music if you get my point. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying really because that's something I experienced. But when we, when working in studio, I'm definitely not going to mix my own music. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. for sure because that that is difficult. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, but 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 uh, and it's impossible. I you know, I don't I don't want to do that really. You know, but but it's still there is something to 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 be hands on with your music as far as possible. Uh, if you get my point, and and mm -hmm. that has been driving me, and that's why I you know. And that after 20 years, I started to earn some money in music. I kind of reinvested it in my studio here and spent the last, yeah, almost 10 years building. And and I mean seriously building. I built everything, That's the awesome. building itself. Every every wow. nail is done by me and every, you know, all the wood, everything from ground up, including the equipment and stuff. Of course, I bought the equipment, though, but mm -hmm. I have to build that myself. But, you know. So, so that was, has been a kind of a, a, a parallel project I've had in the back of my, basically in the back of my jaw, <laughs> but in the back of my head uh, for for many years, and now it's pretty much up and going. So, so you know, I and I kind of find the same, maybe not exactly the same, but I find the same excitement about you know turning a rough mix or a poorly recorded something or a, 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 some recordings into a cool re sounding thing you know yeah. the the whole thing about you know uh, building music if i can say so uh, creating music mm -hmm. uh, it's it's um yeah one of the biggest things i can do in my life um so and i find a lot of the same pleasure mixing for others or mastering for others making coal shines like diamonds for example that's you know it's it's always a pleasure and it's inspiring as well absolutely man that's awesome. That's that's really cool to hear. And uh, I'm always interested what people do to fill their time when they're not on stage. And it sounds like you are helping other people live their dreams and stuff. But um, I, I wanted to ask. So obviously, people are very familiar with like the 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 backstory of Norwegian black metal and metal is such a rich history. Of course, there's the more sensationalized uh, Hollywood version of Lords of Chaos and whatnot. But if you were to. <laughs> You know, you being someone who is from Norway and you're a big heavy metal fan, probably, I'm assuming, growing up, um, what was your first foray into, you know, rock and roll music and then the more, you know, dangerous underground rock music and metal? What what got you into it? Well, uh, you know, I have, I mean, I have to rewind the tape, you know, the, the way back to my, my early, you know, years to be honest you know i had a father which was i was basically i was uh, born and grew up the th two first year of my life i can't remember that though but in a kind of a hippie collective in 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 okay. trondheim so my father was like uh, and my mother as well was very kind of a kind of a hippie style you know living a little bit you know on 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 a radical kind of you know you know all that the whole style sure. i remember back in the day we was traveling a lot in the summertime every every year we had a month in a caravan car kind of thing and just driving around in in europe and stuff like that and a part of this package was music and there was always music you know even if there was a party outside a bonfire or whatever you know and having a good time party or whatever there was only music around and 
my music, my my father was very kind of uh, build his own speakers and stuff, and he also you know you know back in those days, you know that was different times, and he was importing LPs from UK from England in oh. order to transfer to his big uh, tapes, which I now have in my studio actually. Cool. Um, and then he then he resold the LPs in Norway in order to to fund the whole you know cyclus of getting new music and stuff like that. You know, back in the day, you couldn't really yeah. just go online and find everything you want on Spotify, you know. You had to actually get it and pay mm -hmm. for it. So so uh, I think that was the first. I remember I was a small kid. I was like listening to Pink Floyd and all kinds of, you know, on the ground, you know, progressive rock at that time, Steppenwolf, Uriah Heep, you know, the whole shebang. Um, so I'm grown up with this, I think. And at some point, I, I remember, you know, I guess it was a secondary school. I was like 12, 13 years old. I met some other guys that was into metal and rock and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, Twisted Sisters and Accept and, you know, mm -hmm. Art Maiden came in in the picture after a while and Metallic. I remember, I think it was Ride Lightning or something. I bought one of the first albums I actually bought in my life. Um, yeah, I think it was, or maybe Master Purpose, I don't remember. And then, you know, it kind of, the whole thing just rolled the way it usually does, yeah. I guess. Um, searching more music, more interesting music. And at some point, I wanted was more into the more obscure things. Uh, you know, when you have heard all Master Puppets at that time, you know, there was a handful of albums you had to listen, kind of mandatory listen back then. But then I was like, yeah, but there is more to this. There is more bands that you haven't heard about. And we was kind of... We had a couple of good record stores in town, I remember. We could buy, get some really obscure releases and bootlegs yeah. and whatnot. And, and you know, from there, I guess, and, and I remember in the late 80s, uh, 89, 88 or something like that, I got in contact because at that point you, you start to get a little bit older and your kind of your radius is a little bit wider when it comes to traveling and partying and stuff like that. So I... Remember, I, I started to hang out, hang, or we, my my clan, so to speak, <laughs> we was a handful of boys, was traveling to Oos, for, to the guys, uh, some guys in um, on another side, on, on the other side of town, and you know that was the immortal guys back in the day, and wow. I remember wow. I met this guy, uh, Stig from Sadistic Noise Mag. He, he at that time he did one of the biggest underground fan scenes in Norway. He, I think he released like two two fan scenes, three or something like that. And from him, I got a lot of con, you know contacts. I got demos, I got flyers. And then I got into this, what can I say? Um, very special thing, very glorious thing, very interesting thing. I, I, you know, that was so cool back in the day when I, at some point, I remember I, I you know, I. I spent all my money, all my time sending letters, demo cassettes, spreading flyers. You know, it was such a, <laughs> I don't know, it was, you know, a um, special time, to be honest. Uh, but I, at that point, I started to establish network throughout the whole world. I, I remember at, at some point, I, I got like between seven or ten letters each day and every everyone I had to answer you know and I had to go yeah, back yeah. you know big bag of letters and cassettes mm -hmm. and of course and, and flyers and all that and and you know to the post office is sent back you know it's also <laughs> it was a cool thing so that that got me into the underground scene per se uh, demos and and all the obscure band from Finland from US and whatnot you know and and from there, I guess, you know, uh, the Bergen scene was growing up a little bit and becoming something more than just some kids that we had Greg Holland Studios and, you know, a lot of band went there to record demos and stuff. We did also with my my previous band and stuff and, you know, everything just span off from there, I think, I guess. Um, so that's kind of the <laughs> how it started. It's got to be weird to, to 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 like you know flip on a TV and see people these actors playing people that you knew and kind of you know whether it's distorted truths or sensational it's got to be really weird to just be like I lived yeah. that I don't know that's that's kind of weird 
Yeah, you know, I, I was never, I, to be honest about it, I was never really, I never was really fond of this, this, the criminal aspect of the black metal, you know. Sure. I remember, you know, I remember the day the, back in, uh, you know, I, I was, I didn't knew all the guys, but I, I met most of them and I knew some of them more than the other guys and all that. Because, you know, there was like 20, 30 people at that time in Norway playing metal. That's yeah. it. And, and and if we wanted to go to a, a bigger concert and, and there was absolutely nothing in Bergen. So I remember I went to my first, I think it was Morbid, Morbid Angel or Victory or something like that in, in Oslo. We traveled by train. I think it was like 13, 14 years old or something. And then we started to meet, you know, I remember I met uh, Jun from the section there at that point. He was young. I was young long time ago. Um, and then you started to meet the Oslo people and, you know, Things kind of just became, and then the guys, the, the emperor guys, came to Bergen. They lived just, um, they kind of was was uh, sleeping at a, an apartment, um, just some blocks down the street. I remember when recording Nightshed Eclipse and stuff like that. So hang a little bit around with them. And I remember when Enslaved Guys was recording the Frost album. They, I, I, nice. I had to, I, I drove their drum kit to the studio. I remember. Uh, because my father had had a big car, hence the the, the caravan thing. So yeah. we put everything into the car there. Uh, from they came from from with a ferry from from Haugesund and stuff. So you know it was old school back then. Uh, it was by hand. Everything was by hand and by face and in real time, so to speak. But I think some of the magic back then was the fact that you had this boiling scene going on. Um, a lot of, of course, young kids, uh, for mostly boys, so to speak, but you know, a lot of testosterone and a lot of ideas, and we wanted to conquer the world and all that stuff. And you know, some of the magic was, I think, was the fact that we there wasn't no, I, I couldn't go to the pub and play the latest song we have done, the rehearsal room, yeah. because we didn't have a smartphone, we didn't have YouTube, we couldn't send files to each other, we couldn't share, share the IDs. So we had we had to kind of share the IDs by mouth, by, by, by talking about it. And I think, you know, the mental side of that, it's like telling, you know, um, fairy tales back in the day. How, how did fairy tales become... Yeah. I think black metal, you know, came to exist a little bit because of the, of the same mechanism in a sense, because everybody was talking about their stuff. I was talking about my logo. I had didn't have I, I had a one version of my logo at home, <laughs> but I haven't any copy machine or I didn't have a smartphone I can show it, but I could tell the people how it looked and it looked great, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're like, and, it's and, so brutal. And they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. okay, let's yeah, yeah. we can't so, wait. So, I think that was some of the magic back then, to be honest about it. I've been thinking quite a lot because I've got a lot of uh, uh, questions about it, of course. Um, I think some of the magic was this, just this, this thing that we was just talking together, hanging around, talking about music. And of course, you know, the fish is always becoming a little bit bigger for each, you know. <laughs> yeah. So so, so, uh, so I think that was kind of, uh, in itself, it was a kind of a mechanism that sparked some of the magic around this music i i would say at least from my point of view well i appreciate your input man it's 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 also awesome to hear you know uh, someone who was there and someone who's been there and continues to push their art and mm -hmm. and i was going to mention you know i not to get too deep into it but i just I, I i wanted to at least recognize and acknowledge the fact that you know you get a bork nagar album and it's always evolving you know you guys have gotten a lot of you know, you're like soaring vocal operatics, like gorgeous sounding elements. And it's just like this last album that you put out, just like it was brutal, but also catchy. And it was just it was awesome. So I commend you on pu constantly pushing forward with with new stuff. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you, sir. And and I, you can you can you can. Yeah, no worries, man. I mean, that that was also one of my. Uh, principles in life when it comes to music it, it's you know i always compare my music or my musical doing or career or call it whatever you want it should kind of mirror life in a sense i mean and, and life always move forward i mean unless you die of course not but 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 as, as long as i live i you know it's it's always in my it's in my opinion it's very human 
it's the reason why we actually work forwards. I mean, we, I mean, the, the the direction is always forwards, in my opinion, and and the same should go with music, um, I think. And 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 to me, it would be actually quite meaningless to go backwards, um, uh, doing old stuff or trying to do what I did when I was nineteen years old, for example. What's the point with that? Uh, I think, uh, to me, honesty in music is very important uh, uh, virtue, and and I think that uh, you have to be honest about what you're doing, musically speaking. And and in my case, that has to mirror life. And I always make it walk forward. And to me, life is a kind of a journey in a sense. I mean, you you start at one point and you get born and someplace somewhere in 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 this world, yeah. and you end up somewhere another place in this world. But the same thing goes for music, basically, and and you know I, there is you know I, I have to go move forwards. The day I find myself circling myself or walking backwards, something like that, I'm gone. I'm done. Absolutely, man. Well, well, Oyston, Oyston, sorry, you you've Oyston. been more than Oyston. <laughs> you've been more than generous with your time. I have one last question for you. Um, if you could show us, but definitely tell us, pick a scar. On your body, and tell us the story of how you got that scar. Yeah, um, I had um, I have a quite big scar on this, like this. Okay, yeah. It's probably not. Uh, you can probably not see it, but sure. It's it's a knife, and it's kind of it's it's was. Uh, painful and i remember that was one of the first really you know back in when i grew up i grew up the countryside and what we did back then we didn't go to you know uh, kindergartens or anything like that we was up in the forests playing around with knives and and you know looking back now i i you know i can't really understand how we was allowed to do all we did back then sure. we all different times i mean it was driving without any safety belts anyway so yeah. you know everything was different then but but i was walking the forest and building you know um huts and whatnot wow. uh, carving out flutes and climbing trees and all that that was basically my five six seven first years in life Huh. So, so I can remember this cut because that was one of the first cut I really got, and I it was bleeding a lot, and I remember I got ob obnoxious and you know was almost fainting and stuff like that. So, I remember that one. It was really painful. I can remember. I remember mother was stressing a lot and wanted me to go to to a doctor and stuff like that because you could see the bone in the finger. Wow. Okay. But they didn't they didn't do that. But but it also gives me good po positive memories. Because you know that the, the freedom back then, just being outside in the forest with a knife, you and yourself, with maybe some friends or whatever, but basically being a free spirit in the forest, you know that sense of feeling is something I cherish a lot, and I try to bring into my music this this free spirit that uh, you know um, being yourself on your own terms in the nature, just you and the nature, nothing between you and nature, you know all that stuff. It's, it's something I've always cherished a lot. And 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 so that's that the scar kind of reminds me of that about that time. I remember the place. I can still go to the same place. I I cut this 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 wow. uh, scar. So so it's 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 a little treasure for me. It's it's a lot of good memories, even though it was painful back then. It sounds like a magical childhood for real, though. Yeah, I, I would awesome. say so. I mean, I mean, to me it was, and 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 you know, when we got, when I got uh, kids myself, actually, me and my wife was early on because she comes from a, a countryside as well, not in northern Norway. We was very determined that when the day comes that we gonna get some kids. If we're gonna get some kids, we we yeah, we got some kids then, and we <laughs> we actually moved back to my 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 place of upbringing right. because I wanted to try. It's a different time now. The yeah. climate has changed. There is no winters really anymore. There is really no summer. Also, everything is fucked up because of the climate change, though. But, 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 um, what I wanted as far as possible to give my kids the same possibilities as us as I had. This freedom, right. just walking out in nature, no bothers, no restrictions, nobody, you know, 
do whatever you want to do and use your Im imagination because that is what you do when you're in nature. You have to find solutions. Mm -hmm. You have to get over stuff. You have to go through stuff. You have to, you know, whatever. So, so it, it, it's, it's, it's a good way of learning, I would say. You don't freeze. I mean, people, kids nowadays, they don't know what freezing is. They don't know what starving is. I mean, I'm not just disrespectful because I know there is a lot of people that has horrible situation, sure. not getting enough food. And, 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 but if you're talking about our civilization or, you know, modern yes. civilization, um, at least in Norway, which is a very kind of rich country, uh, we have a very good health system and you don't have to worry too much about things in Norway, to be honest about it. Uh, but I've been kind of thinking about, uh, you know, the, the fact that I think, yeah, I think that Kids should feel starvation sometimes. They should feel the, the freezing cold sometimes, just to know what it is. Because then you also might have some empathy for, you know, when you see a picture of a kid starving, for example. Or, Good point. You know. so, so for me, yeah. it's a part of important part of the upbringing to also feel, if you get my point, feel the forces of nature in a sense that you feel the danger. The, the 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 beauty of nature there i mean there is so many beautiful things in nature being on a mountaintop is one of the biggest feelings mm -hmm. i can have in my life i have behind my house uh, one of the biggest mountain in in, in bergen area wow. me and my father used to go there a lot and I, I still go there not so much anymore because i don't have the time for it but that is some of the greatest feeling i can have you, mm -hmm. You're really pushing yourself. You're kind of tasting blood and you're sweating like a dog. But when you get up there, you feel like, wow, it's such a, I mean, that's a kick. Uh, you know, those things is something I, I would love to, to, you know, bring on to my kids. But, you know, again, world is different now. World is different now. Well, man, it's been awesome talking with you about a variety of topics and everything from Borknagar to 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 mountaintops to the countryside it's been awesome man and and again i i beg you to please buy a ticket for this show because it'll probably sell out if it hasn't already devastation of the nation tour at el corazon sunday april 24th riding christ wolfheart abigail williams mighty bork nagar coming back to the united states it's gonna be an epic tour uh oyster uh i keep getting it wrong austin austin <laughs> austin okay thank you so much for taking the time man any final words for the northwest audience Oh, thank you for, yeah, for everyone listening to this. Thank you to everybody and thank you for the support. We have a lot of, I know we have a lot of fans in the U.S. And, uh, you know, we, we appreciate that so much. It's, you know, it's it's, a, it's touching sometimes. I get tons of messages on my phone and mails and all that. So yeah. we are looking so much forward to get back to the States and have a really, really good time as party of the century. So, uh, so I'm, yeah. What can I say? Looking forward, guys. Awesome. April 24th at El Corazon, Devastation of the Nation. Thank you so much, man.